Um, you've heard a little bit uh, from NASA before about using prizes and competitions um, and crowdsourcing in those areas. Um, but I'm going to be talking more about how we can use, how we've used um, crowdsourcing actually in government to get uh, more work done, specifically to open data. And so um, what I worked on last year was a project to use the public, um, to enable the public to work with USAID to clean and geocode a data set so that it could be made o open. And so that sounds funny to, um, have the public clean a data set before it's open, um, because how can you do that, right, if it's not open yet? So you'll see a list of um, challenges that I had to deal with within the United States bureaucracy um, and a lot of the laws um, and policies that exist that are um, big obstacles for crowdsourcing that I was able to overcome and write a case study about documenting how others in government and in NGOs could convince their leadership to overcome similar obstacles. So I really hope that this concrete example will be really useful for other people in the room. Um, so the, the project that I did was within my office. It's the Economic Growth Bureau at USAID. And just to give you a little bit of background so you understand the data that we had, um, my office is called the Development Credit Authority. And we get banks in developing countries to lend their own money to entrepreneurs who can't get financing. And we do that by guaranteeing loans um, that are made by those banks. And so um, we've had um, over 300 guarantees around the world and 117,000 loans. These are individual loans given by banks, again, in developing countries to entrepreneurs that opened up to over $2 billion in local financing. And so the whole data set that I wanted to open and map um, was basically an Excel chart of 117,000 records that are individual loans. And so why did we want to open this data in the first place? Why was that important? Um, first of all, we wanted to um, have this map available so that we could have more targeted lending to the areas that no loans were going to. So if you see all the loans on a map, all the projects where you're working, then you can see where you're not working and where you need to target future lending. Um, you could do better analysis of your work. You, other donors could see on a map where they're working and where you're working and where you can actually work together in the future. And um, entrepreneurs can use the map to really see where they can get financing from, um, from a USAID guaranteed loan. So um, here's where the, the problem was. I had this Excel chart, and the top of this page is what our Excel chart looked like. Um, so there was a field for location, and um, we've collected location information about each of these loans over 12 years. And so all of the location information was um, really um, non-standardized is the basic problem here. You can see Port-au-Prince, sometimes we had cities, sometimes we had full street addresses, sometimes we had just the region name. And so the solution was we needed to parse out all that information into separate columns, but also if you knew the city name, we wanted to get the state name so we could map at the city level across all 117,000 records. And so someone had to actually sit, through, sit and do 117,000 data points here to make it so we could map it. So what was the solution? Within the government, um, we typically think of the same solutions over and over again. And so at USAID, those typical solutions that we would turn toward are contractors um, or, you know, lock interns up in the basement and have them go through all these records. Um, we didn't have money available, though, for this project. Um, and we didn't have the time to actually sit through and do 117,000 records ourselves. And so we decided to think outside of the box and why not use the crowd um, who we knew that the public um, in the US and abroad was very excited to work with USAID in new ways and they wanted to collaborate with us. And so we said why not tap into that energy and really harness it to have this partnership where they can help us um, go through and geocode this data set so that we could open it and map it. So I brought that idea to um, the general counsel's office at USAID. Um, there's a lot of lawyers at USAID within government. And I said, I want to do this. I want to, for the first time, use, use crowdsourcing to um, open up this data set. Um, so here's the, the list of reasons. Um, well, first of all, they said, why, why would anyone volunteer a weekend to clean a, an Excel chart for you? That's never, ever going to happen. Um, so that was the first thing. But aside from that, the legal problems that they presented, um, one, the US government is not allowed to use free labor. So you can't go to the crowd um, because that's free labor. Um, plus, someone asked before about displacing um, US or workers with crowdsourcing. And you're not allowed to um, displace any worker who would have done this. Um, with the crowd because we have strong unions protecting labor rights and so um, we you can't have that displacement. Um, the second problem was we actually signed non-disclosure agreements with the banks that we work with. 
And so we could actually go to jail and get fined if we disclosed private strategic information, which was included in a lot of this data. The third reason I couldn't do this um, was we have laws about personal identifiable information, PII. I'm sure other countries have the same laws, saying that if you have any data sets that have personal private information about individuals, you can't disclose that information because that's private information to an individual person. And finally, um, we couldn't do this project because um, there's an Information Quality Act saying you need to, the government, if they're giving out information to the public, it has to be high quality. And if you're having the crowd actually go through and clean a data set, how do you know that the work is going to be high enough quality to actually release it? So I was very discouraged at that point, and I said, how can you possibly overcome all of these different issues? Um, um, which brings me to another point, which is if you're going to be a crowdsourcing leader in government, probably any government, it takes someone who's very perseverant to actually overcome issues. Because unless you um, have the energy to fight these and other hurdles that will come up, um, it's really easy to say, okay, I can't do this. And there's a lot of people um, who are afraid of opening data and afraid of sharing information with the public because once you do, it opens you up to a lot of criticism. Um, and so people say, why are you doing this? You shouldn't do this. There's so many risks. And so unless you really believe in open government and the power of the people by enabling citizens to interact differently with their democracy, then you're not going to actually have, have the, the courage to kind of go through these steps. Um, and the other thing that you need to actually go through this, besides the answers that I'll talk about, um, is high-level leadership that, that believes in doing this and is willing to back the, the person who's going through these steps. So um, I'm just going to knock these out pretty fast, like what I did to overcome these issues. Um, so free labor, you can't use free labor. Um, first of all, we had to affirm, which we did, that um, we were not displacing any government worker. In fact, if, if we didn't use crowdsourcing for this project, it wouldn't get done. We didn't have the people or the resources to do this. Um, two, uh, the second way we got around the youth, uh, free labor issue was when people signed up online to participate in this event to clean and geocode this data, they had to check a box saying, I agree that I'm not going to get paid for this. I'm not going to sue the US government. Um, I'm not going to waive any compensation. And so um, because they clicked that, um, we were able to overcome those and uh, those, those, all those hurdles. Um, for non -dis the Non-Disclosure Act with the bank, uh, we actually had to delete a lot of columns from our Excel chart before we opened it at the end. Um, if, I, if I tell you the list of columns that I deleted, which I can do, it's, it's publicly available, what I deleted, you would say, what's left, right? Um, things I deleted um, range from the interest rates, um, whether or not the borrower defaulted on the loan, the purpose of the loan, the bank's name, the borrower's name, the business name. So it's a lot of really, really good data that could get, lead to a lot of great analysis. But again, um, that was all private strategic information that we couldn't actually um, release. Um, and so there's, of course, compromising and opening data. And so um, as long as you're public about what you're not releasing, then um, there's still a great amount of information that we did release. Um, which is all online and public, so you can see what it is. Um, the third issue, personal identifiable information. So that was a, a hard one. Um, basically, we had, so this Excel chart that we had that we opened was, had a lot of different fields and had a lot of columns. What we gave to the crowd to clean um, basically only had the, like, two fields, or three fields. One was a number that we could match it back up to the other data set when we were finished, the country name, and then the location field. So they didn't know anything else about the information except those three fields. Um, and so, and we, we deleted all the numbers. So if there was an address, we just put pound signs where the numbers were. So no one could actually identify anything about that individual. And then by the time we put it back into the bigger data set, um, all that, you couldn't tell who was who. Um, and so that, that also made people comfortable. Um, and then finally, Information Quality Act. Um, there were two things we did to get around those um, not get around, but um, to address that very real issue. Um, one is that it wasn't random people that were our crowd. Um, we had people sign up to participate online on data.gov, and once they made an account, we knew who they were, so they weren't random people from the public anymore. Um, we also had a lot of QAQC, quality assurance, quality control in place, um, to really check the work that the crowd had done. Um, so if someone had made a mistake, um, then we could actually pull up all the records that person had done by their email address and delete them all and give them back to the crowd if someone was just getting this, this wrong and didn't know what, what they were supposed to do. Um, 
we also wanted to get percentages um, of accuracy after the project had finished. And so that was pr part of the quality assurance, quality control. And we crowdsourced that out as well to um, an expert portion of the crowd who was very good at crowdsourcing. So um, we needed a platform for crowdsourcing. And as I said, we didn't have any resources. So um, I considered a lot of different platforms. I considered having the government um, create a crowdsourcing platform so that we could build a community and have that to reach out to in the future. Um, and you heard yesterday um, Kaordic speak about um, working with USAID and one of the challenges was not having a crowd to go to. USAID didn't have that crowd so they worked with MTV and MTV had that crowd. Um, and so I had that same problem and that's why I said well maybe we could build a community and tap that community in the future. But that would cost money of course and I wanted to do this with no resources, no additional resources. And so um, I went to data.gov, which is used to open government data, and I was like, well, why don't we just use that platform and tweak it so people can actually use it as an interactive platform to check out records and then check them back in once they were finished. And so we were ultimately able to do that with this platform. Um, and Socrata is the contractor who runs that platform, so they um, volunteered a couple of hours of their, of their time to build this app that you see that um, basically says, here are the instructions, which were set up in a Google document. Um, Here's the Skype channel, so we made it social so people could chat with each other and answer each other's questions during the crowdsourcing event. Um, and then we had a box, as I mentioned, to, to check off if you agree to the, the lawyer ease um, to be able to participate. And then to make it easy for, or for people to find the state um, to do the actual crowdsourcing work, we developed a crowdsourcing tool where they could put in an address and then figure out what the, the state is and the state code. Um, Great, so the crowd, who was the crowd? So um, we went out to the public and we um, used social media to kind of get the word out. So half of our volunteers actually came from Twitter and Facebook. Um, the other half came from um, two volunteer geocoding organizations. One was called GIS Corps and one is Standby Task Force. These are global um, volunteer organizations of people, of crowd basically, that um, wanted to um, all the time just volunteer to help um, different causes and so they said our members would be really interested in exposing all this economic growth data that USAID has um, and so we want to volunteer. So we started the event on a Friday at noon um, and we said we would go all you know from Friday noon until Sunday at midnight and that was the time period when we wanted all these records clean. Um, before that weekend we had some test practices with small groups of leaders from the crowd so that we could really understand the process and if they had any questions we could make sure to document that. And so in those test runs we learned that there were a lot of really easy records um, that they didn't want to necessarily spend all their time doing. And so we partnered with the Department of Defense um, and they created a, a computer script to auto geocode the easy records. So we got those out of the way and then we had hard records that you really needed the human mind to look at to figure out how to geocode them. And so we had the crowd do those harder records. Um, at the end of, so we started Friday at noon. Um, we started with a five hour in-person event, come to USAID in person in Washington DC and crowdsource with us with your computers. And so we had about 50 people show up to that and people were really, really excited to be a part of it. And then after that, you go home and do it from online around the world. Um, Saturday, 4 a.m., we finished all the records. Um, it took us 16 hours to clean um, and geocode all of these records. People who had signed up to participate on Saturday and Sunday woke up and were really upset because they saw a splash, a splash page saying, sorry, we're done. Um, thank you for signing up. And they're like, no, we really wanted to be part of you at this like, historic event. And so they were pretty bummed, but um, we were really happy that we were able to finish um, the project in that amount of time and that we had that much interest. And so um, I mentioned before that a lot of the, the lawyers um, at USAID and within government, of course, were afraid um, of quality control of how well did the crowd do. Um, and so we actually had these ex this expert team um, of geographic experts who are part of the GIS Corps. Um, that, so we crowdsourced to them the checking of the results. And they took samples of the computer script and of the batch that the crowd did. And it turned out that of the computer script, there was only a 64% accuracy. Um, and of the records that the crowd did, there was an 85% accuracy. So the crowd was actually much more accurate in cleaning these, these records than the computer script was. And that was actually because um, the computer script just took the first word and assumed that was the city and would look for in that country a city and then find the state. And someone, 
someone's mind looking at that record would say, oh, that's actually like maybe a street name, and they could really better decipher what was what within the field. Um, and so it, it was a victory of, of humans over computers that day, and we were really happy that um, we were able to make people within government more comfortable with crowdsourcing results. Um, yesterday we had a question about ethics, like whether or not it's ethical to you know, if you're exploiting volunteers or not. And it was funny because I mentioned that we, we use Facebook and Twitter heavily for this event. And we had so many positive comments. And there was one person who commented, I can't believe you're exploiting all of these um, poor people in the United States to clean your, your data set. Just do this work yourself. What are you doing? Um, but that was one comment. And every other comment was really positive, saying, again, like, we want to help. Like, do these more often, please. Like, we want to engage with government. And government's so often a one-way street. So please create opportunities like this so we can work together as partners. So this is um, one quote we got after the event. I haven't felt like this since the soup kitchens and food drives I used to do in college. I love this. Um, so people were, um, as I mentioned, really excited. Um, and our social media numbers really skyrocketed after um, this event took place. So um, the lessons that I learned from this event, um, one, um, so we talked about incentivizing people through prizes and competitions. This was really, really collaborative. Um, in the process, we built up leads who could answer questions. Um, I couldn't stay up the entire night, and so when I was sleeping, we had other team leads who were from the crowd um, available to answer questions on Skype that people had. Um, but people were participating. I asked them why they were there even on Friday during the day at USAID, and they said, we wanted to meet you. We wanted to, to like, put a face to our government. Um, so they were just excited um, to build that community. And even though crowdsourcing is virtual, um, because we have a Skype room, it, it felt like you knew the people that you were talking to. I mean, I'm sure we've all been in chat rooms, and so there is a sense of community that's built, um, and you get to meet people. So, so that social aspect really mattered. Um, crawl, walk, run. Um, if we would have just gone straight to doing the, the big event at the end without doing two test runs, I think it would not have gone off well because we really learned lessons from each one um, on how to hone the process and the instructions um, that made the final uh, weekend run really smoothly. Um, no cost solutions. So a lot of government agencies say we don't have the money, we don't have the time, we don't have the resources to open our data to share information. Um, but look, you actually do. You, you have the resources. Um, it, it, it does take time, like my time to manage the volunteers. And I had one other um, partner, Shadrach, Shadrach Roberts at USAID from our Geo Center. We did the project together. So. Um, we spent a lot of time managing the volunteers, but we pulled this whole thing off in three months and we had other jobs that our normal daytime job that we were doing too. Um, and so this is definitely manageable to do even if you don't have any um, funds to do, um, like a big prize or something along those lines. Um, PII, the publicly identifiable information, a lot of um, government agencies have data, but they say they can't open it because there's confidential information about people in there. But as I, as I kind of proved with this project, if you delete certain columns and you make it so everything is anonymized, um, and you make sure that with other data sets that are out there, you can't mash them together and figure out who the original person was, um, then there are ways that you, that shouldn't be a roadblock to actually getting data out and to moving forward with opening data. Um, one other lesson, um, if you have a database where you're collecting um, geographic information, make sure you have separate fields for um, city and state. That sounds really obvious today, but we didn't, and that's why we had to do this, and a lot of other people may not still as well. So um, right after we finished this event, we actually fixed our database so that when banks enter the location of their loans, they would do it in separate fields um, with standardized <coughs> formats um, attached to gazetteers and so forth. Um, and then finally, we talked about this a lot at this conference, understanding why people volunteer. People want to make, especially with government, people want to make a difference and connect. Um, and so that really mattered to people, and that's why they did this, not for glory or guts or what was the other one? For gold. Um, so, um, so the end result was we were able to release um, a global map, um, not just to the country level, but if you zoom in, you can see states within each country. Um, and click on them and then kind of get an interactive map where you see every loan that's been dispersed and how much money there, um, women borrowers, first time borrowers, a lot of really great information. We also um, published all of our data on um, data.gov with APIs so developers could pull that um, information automatically. And we also um, created a, a dashboard where we could see 
instant up-to-date um, results about how we're performing around the world so we could do better work in the future. Um, we wrote a 25-page case study documenting um, this whole project, and it's available online. If, if you go to USAID DCA map, um, you could pull up the, the map, and I'll, that will be on the next slide, I think, the three words you Google, Google and then it's the first link that comes up. Um, the next slide, I promise, is there. Um, so, so that was um, the project, and just in terms of looking ahead and where we're going in the future, um, right now, basically after we, we crowdsourced um, the location of all of our guarantees, we thought, wouldn't it be great to crowdsource um, real-time information about um, people who need access to financing um, and where they are at any given moment? And so we have partnered with the UN Global Pulse, um, and they've done a lot of really good work in mining big data and available data out there to figure out what's going on. And there's actually been presentations yesterday, um, a couple that kind of touched on big data for predictive um, modeling in the future. And so that's exactly what we're, this is USAID's first time in experimenting with harvesting data that's out there, looking at people's digital footprint, and then seeing what information you can pull without um, proactive crowdsourcing. So I don't know if you, yesterday we tried to define crowdsourcing and whether or not, uh, what it is. So I don't know if harvesting data that's out there from the crowd without their um, knowing participation counts as crowdsourcing. Um, but if you think about it, I mean, everything you do online, if you do a Google search, you're typing information about what you want, and if you're able to harvest everyone's Google searches and everyone's tweets, then in a way you are doing crowdsourcing because you're sourcing information from a crowd even though they're not um, participating in your event on purpose. Um, and so we're, we're try experimenting with this in Kenya right now where we're seeing what people are saying about financial inclusion and their ability to access loans so that we can see today where, um, what sectors people need financing in. Um, we don't have to wait for future numbers to come out by the government um, later on, but instead use numbers we're getting today instantly um, to, um, to predict in real time what, um, where we should be targeting our future lending. So this is um, what you can search, USAID DCA map, um, to pull up the case study and the map and all of the data that's available. Um, and I'll leave it at that. We have a panel afterwards, so I'm happy to take questions as part of the panel.